you know, it's, during the off season right now is a great time to focus on how you're gonna hunt in the fall. And uh, when it comes to hunting, everyone since way back in the day, you know, I know Michigan, I come from a big baiting state. Um, I tell the story when I was 16, I wasted a, a lot of money to me at the time on some uh, dough urine and, you know, put a little out. I remember going in, I remember exactly where I was sitting on Pontiac State Le Recreation Area, right on public land, state land. Uh, remember that whole hunt. Um, in fact, I remember seeing some bikers. This is when they were first putting mountain biker trails in back in the day. And I remember bikers coming through during the hunt, which seemed crazy to me in the background. But anyways, put a little scent out, nothing comes in. Well, a half hour later, put a little bit more out. Ah, it's gotta work, you know, I keep putting more out. And all of a sudden that whole bottle, it's like this big and costs twelve dollars or whatever it was to me at the time that i didn't have was gone <laughs> all in one set and but the whole hope was that i was using the attraction to bring deer in i'm going to tell you three attractions and even a fourth that uh that have worked and stood the test of time you know i'm not quite in my uh dylan i'm trying to think back now is it my this will be my 40th hunting season Dang, dude. uh next year will be my 40th season so i'm on number 30 39 right now all right so i'm not quite that old or that experienced but when you hit 40 though that's that's a lot <laughs> so anyways that'll be next season uh 2025 2024 only 39th season but anyways these are what's worked i'll tell you what, water holes water holes are awesome doesn't matter if it's a mud hole out in the out in the uh, hardwoods that you find on an abandoned two track and it's a low depression area that holds water and there's clay there or it's the tanks that we like to put in i love water i'll tell you real quick um we've migrated you know throughout the years from 27 and a half gallon cut 55 gallon barrels 20 years ago to 300 gallon tanks now because we know that when we fill those up in september they'll last to the end of the season Deer only go through about 100 gallons every four weeks. If you have a 50 gallon tank, you're done in two weeks to do the math. And once the deer come to it a couple times and it's not there over a week, they don't come back for two or three weeks. It takes a long time to reestablish that pattern of use. So 27 and a half gallons, we knew that wasn't even close to being enough. So we migrated to 110, 110 gallon tanks. There was a brief period in there, I went to 150 and now it's all 300s. We've swapped out even our 150s, 110s because we don't want to go back into our favorite hunting site with a machine and fill middle of October or right during the rut. So that larger size is great, but <clears throat> what I really like about them is they're low risk. A mature buck thinks nothing, if he's thirsty, about hitting those mid-morning, mid-afternoon, middle of the day, and lunchtime, doesn't really matter, he'll hit it any time because we're not sticking them in a food source. We're sticking them in between bedding and food, closer to bedding. Areas where a mature buck wants to be during the daylight. He just comes over here and gets a drink. You put that on a food plot, you now raise the risk of that water hole to that of the food plot, which is much higher, several times higher than a water hole. So a water hole gives us an option to hunt in the morning, afternoon, all day long, and it's a very powerful tool to attracting a buck. And I like water holes and tanks instead of dug ponds because in areas of concern of EHD, the EHD li lives and propagates in dry and cracking and receding mud holes. So when you have a pond, even if it's 10 feet across, you've dug it with a berm on the one end, maybe a relief pipe. As that water recedes during the late summer and, have that cr and it has that cry and cracking, cracking mud, that's where the midge lives, lives and propagates for EHD. And that helps spread EHD. So everything that comes to that water hole now has a chance of getting EHD. To me, it's a super spreader sometimes. And so a tank doesn't have dry, cracking, receding mud in it. We put a little uh, soil down at the bottom just so it's more natural. You want it swampy, you want it algae filled, no different than a mud hole, it's mosquito infested. You don't want to put chemicals in to reduce mosquitoes. That's natural to deer. Natural smells, natural taste. You want it more natural. We use a tank, we dig, we dig it down below grade level. If you're in a fantasy land state of Iowa, Kansas, maybe Kentucky, portions of Missouri, Nebraska, areas where there's low deer hunting pressure, you can stick a tank on top of the ground, it can be metal and they'll still come and hit it. That doesn't work in areas of Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, New York, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois. Illinois, everyone thinks about big buck state. There's a lot of people that hunt Illinois, over 200,000 bow hunters. 
Iowa 65,000 bow hunters, Kansas 25,000 bow hunters. So a lot different in pressure wise. And when you get over in the Western Illinois, there's some, that's more fantasy land area. But bottom line is water holes are incredible. You go back two years, we put a new water hole in. Jen and I shot bucks on that with our bows. We only sat there about five times total between us and Dante or, and Jen and I. I think that might've been her first sit. And we shot two mature bucks out of that. It was an awesome setup and hunt for both those deer. And uh, one was morning and one was afternoon, evening. So really good opportunities. Last year I sat there and saw four-year-old Shorty that I passed up there. Uh, this year I shot one uh, in two, the season 2023, shot a really nice target buck in Wisconsin over a water hole. So shot a lot of bucks over water holes. Really good opportunity in those bucks because it's low risk, they're in there for a minute and they just move on. So really outstanding attraction hey guys thanks for watching the video we'll be right back i really want you to check out our seed company pure wildlife blends we changed the name from whs to reflect pure what our seeds all about and our company is all about right now is a great time to be putting down our perennial our green max traffic blend for trails and around the water holes our switchgrass our summer soil explosion it's amazing what people are buying right now, even going all the way into the fall, getting all their seed available right now. We'll have it all year though, you don't have to rush. Check it out while you're at it, while you're on the website, check out our How You Design Your Whitetail Parcel. It's a great web class and some of the other ones. We have lots to offer, including the books too. Make sure you don't miss out. Now back to the video. Food plots. Now if it's a big food plot, you can't avoid spooking deer when you get in and out, don't hunt it. Let that sink in, don't hunt it. You can't hunt a big food source or a food source that you spook deer off. It has a ripple effect. It means that not just that food plot, but the area surrounding probably 200 yards on any side, deer don't feel comfortable in because they know that that area is a nighttime area only, especially mature bucks recognize that you can't spook those deer. So let's look at it as it is a small hunting plot on the way to a big food plot. Then those can be huge attractions. I shot bow over a small hunting plot last year. He's coming from bedding, going through the small hunting plot on his way to bigger food, just a pass through. You know, great opportunity, that's, that's a true hunting plot when they're just on the way passing through. You're just getting a glimpse into the world, you can manage your scent, manage your approach, get in and out without spooking deer, that's a hunting plot. It can be very attractive, but again, it's not an all day set typically like a water hole. Now, number three, bedding areas. I love bedding areas. I love getting up into a bedding area where we don't go to till, until the end of October, November. It's a rut area, pre-rut area, so we're waiting for bucks to come back to us. We get into a position on the side of that bedding area where we can completely manage our scent. Either we're blowing it off a cliff, we're blowing it into an open field nearby, maybe even idle horse pasture, cow pasture. We're blowing it somewhere where deer don't expect or we don't expect deer to be downwind of us so we can manage our scent. We get in there early, wait for the deer to come to us. Sometimes we get in there just in time because if we need thermals to keep our scent up, then we'll get there right at daybreak so that we can manage our scent and where it goes, make sure that it goes above a bedding, bedding area. There's areas with morning thermals, you can blow your scent into a bedding area, but you have to wait for the sun to come up and for the temperature to start to warm up. Thermals move with, move with temperature. So if it's super shaded on a the side, they're not gonna get that sun exposure. Those thermals might sit for a while later in the morning. That's why they only move down in the last half hour, 45 minutes, because that's when the temperature changes in the afternoon. It doesn't change for three hours going down. It's typically warm all the way up to about 45 minutes before, and then it starts to drop. And then that's when those thermals drop. But a bedding area is awesome. That's where overall I've killed the most of my, the majority of my mature bucks have been relating to a bedding area in the morning, waiting for them to come back to me. And you think bedding area, you think, well, let's add a water hole and a food plot. Food plot now takes that bedding area and displaces mature bucks. So if you have, you're truly getting to an area where a mature bucks feels comfortable in the morning, put a food source there and the bigger it becomes, but any food source, but the bigger it becomes, the further and further he'll bed away from that and feel safe. So you really have to be careful. And I would not put a, if you have a great bedding area, one of the best ways to ruin a bedding area is to add a food source to it, add a food plot. People talk about planting their trails in the bedding area. That's a, that's a really, really bad rookie move. 
because if you have great food within the bedding area theory, why, do you, why would you move to other food sources in the afternoon where you can hunt in afternoon stands? But if you have food in the bedding area, why is he there in the first place? He doesn't like being by food. The more appreciable the food and recognizable it is, the more it attracts does and fawns, the more he won't be there. He recognizes food as stress. His daytime bedding area is the lowest level of stress in his world. Add food to it, you just ruined it. However, a water hole is low stress. That's why I have on here, yes, add water to the edge of a bedding area. No, don't add food to the edge of a bedding area. That combination bedding and water, incredible. We go a long ways out of our way, like the spot two years ago where Jen and I shot both our bucks that year with bows. We have water on the edge of a bedding area. There's a couple of those areas this year where we're moving around water on the edge of bedding areas. We're putting a road into one to get in and out. Walk in for hunting, we'll go out a different way. We're putting a lot of effort into it like we did in the one two years ago. We put a 300 yard road into that one in a water hole. It's worth the effort, huge reward when you combine those two together. And people say, well, a mock scrape. You know, I talk about mock scrapes over the, all the time. I believe I have over 60 mock scrape videos online. Been talking about a hanging vertical mock scrape since day one. People look at those. I talked about them, originated that as far as not with a rope. Another rookie move. Ropes are not natural. They hit ropes less. I've seen thousands and thousands of rope scrapes in the woods and natural is always best. We use vine or branches, always best. It sounds better, you know, rope scrape, it'll last forever, but I've seen 500 on a 200 acre, 200 acre parcel that weren't hit. They, don't, they aren't natural. So while they'll work, especially in fantasy land states, they don't work everywhere. And even in a fantasy land, fantasy land state, natural is always, always best when it comes to mock scrape. The reason I don't talk about mock scrapes in these attractions, we have a mock scrape at every stand location. No more, no less. If you have a lot of mock scrapes around a food source, it doesn't mean that you're managing the buck's time because you have more bucks all the way around that, that food plot and he has to work on 30 different scrapes. That's not time management for bucks. That's not holding more bucks on your land because you have more scrapes. That's not the way it works, folks. They only have time in the day to hit the same number of scrapes and they'll make them. You don't have to hold their hand though. The, the big thing is, is the reason we put a mock scrape at stand location, when that buck comes in, for one, it's inventory. We know it's at that stand. They're gonna hit that mock scrape. If there's a scrape, a natural scrape, that's going to take them out of the path of that stand location where we can shoot them with a bow, then we'll get rid of it. We want them to key on that mock scrape. We have one mock scrape. That means that every doe, fawn, and buck that goes by that mock scrape will leave their scent on it. We talk about the test we did two years ago, 60 days where we had a, a mock rub with a mock scrape. We had 22 bucks hit the rub in 60 days. There's shavings everywhere. It looked awesome. That's a lot too because the average scrape rub in the wood is the average rub in the woods is probably hit about one to two times a year. So 22 times in 60 days is a lot. However, the mock scrape hanging 10 feet away was hit 210 times, one third by bucks, one third by does, one third by fawns. That's the difference between a mock scrape and a rub. And that's why we put mock scrapes at all of our stand locations and not mock rubs. In a deer's world, rubs aren't that important. Scrapes are everything. So we have one at every stand, no more, no less. When the buck comes in, for one, it's narrowing down his trails and he might pass through by. Two, they're all leaving their scent on that one mock scrape. And three, they're not paying attention to you in the stand. They're not paying attention to the camera nearby. They're focusing on that scrape when they come in, they hit the scrape and they move on. We have one at every stand location, so that's a given. What's the best one between water hole food plot and bedding area. I'm gonna go with the bedding area and add a water hole to it, but some areas already have water. Some areas don't need water. So overall, while you have to have food on your property to have a good hunt, if you have private land, you have to have quality food, not browse, not soft mass, hard mass, you gotta have food plot. But outside of that, bedding cover, is my favorite attraction for mature bucks. That means you need to have food, screening along that food, doe bedding, young buck bedding, and finally, if there's enough room left over within depth of cover, the concept I teach, then you actually have room for mature bucks, and that becomes the number one favorite spot of mine to shoot a mature buck every 
single season.